I don't know if I've talked about this before, but when I was in elementary school and up and through middle school, uh, I delivered uh, a newspaper every day. It was the Grand Rapids Press. Uh, at the time, it was a seven-day newspaper. I know, like that's a rare thing these days unless you're a major metropolitan area. Uh, so after school, uh, Monday to Friday in the morning, Saturday and Sunday, uh, I had a section of 20-some. My sister had six that she delivered. Uh, she was the youngest, and my brother had like 30 that he delivered. So it was a family thing. On uh, Sunday, Dad would drive, and my brother and I would do the whole thing together. We did that for years. The money I earned, uh, and I was trying to remember, I think it was $30 a month, uh, which at the time... It uh, seemed like a lot. The money I earned uh, is now contained in two very heavy tubs of baseball cards. Uh, that was the investment I was making as a young man. It didn't really work out. They're not worth much of anything these days. Uh, but I would have bought them anyway because my friends and I were fascinated with trying to complete sets and find certain players uh, in all of that. Well, for one of the yearly Christmas plays that Galilee Baptist Church put on, and uh, as a child growing up there, you were in the Christmas play whether you wanted to be or not, uh, whether they made you dress up like an animal for the nativity scene or not, which of course was mortifying in third grade or fourth grade, but they did it. Uh, for one of those plays, the director, and I don't remember who was in charge of it that year, uh, went outside the box and cast me as a newspaper delivery boy in the play. You know, that was some real, it took some real acting chops to be able to pretend to be someone who delivered newspapers, uh, considering that I had been doing that for years. Uh, and I remember that that play started with me coming from the vestibule in through the doors and up the aisle shouting as you know a, a newspaper kid does, right? Extra, extra, read all about it, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's been a while, so I don't remember the plot of this play, uh, but, at, but the character that I was playing uh, was the one that needed, he was the giver of news, but he had to learn the news uh, of, of the birth of Christ uh, kind of thing. Uh, others taught it to him so that he could share it with others, that sort of thing. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no surviving video footage of that performance. I'm sure it was taped on VHS, and hopefully by now they've all been destroyed uh, or time has gotten them. Because I would imagine that we acted and sang just about as well as most children putting on a play with minimal practice did. So I don't necessarily think it was uh, Oscar-worthy performance. Talking about sharing good news, about sharing news in general, let's take a look uh, once again at the prophet Isaiah as we continue this theme in uh, an Advent. So chapter 49 to 11 starts with this. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem. And you see the textual variant. Uh, it's, it's not in the manuscripts. It's in the, it's in the translation. The other translation would be uh, Zion, bringer of good news. Go up on a high mountain. Jerusalem, bringer of good news. That translation question is whether the news is being brought to Zion and Jerusalem, those are of course synonyms, or brought from Zion in Jerusalem. In the end, we're going to end up in the same place because once Zion and Jerusalem know the good news, it's not supposed to stop there. It's supposed to radiate outward from that epicenter, much the same as Jesus' command to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they are to begin in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That connection to Acts 1, 8 is fitting because we saw last week in Isaiah 41 to 5 that the comfort the prophet proclaimed to the exiles in Babylon that comfort being that God's wrath had run its course, was very much good news for them. It was good news for the people living in exile in Babylon to hear that the time of punishment has ended, the time of rebuilding is coming. But we also saw that the larger fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, which came 500 years later through John the Baptist declaring the arrival of the Messiah, the living embodiment 
of good news about which we're reminded every year, especially when Linus gives his magnificent speech in a Charlie Brown Christmas, right? Everybody loves that. He shares good tidings of great joy which shall be for all people in his quotation of Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Isaiah had good news for the exiles, news that they longed to hear. It was better news than they dared hope for. The temple would be rebuilt. The city would be restored. You can go home soon. Fast forward 500 years, you have the angel telling the shepherds, and then a few years later, John the Baptist echoing it that beginning of the good news. News of reconciliation, transformation. This was the news the disciples were willing to be martyred for as they shared it with the world. News of victory over sin and death. So Isaiah says about the news coming to Zion, to go up on a high mountain, and what should you do there? Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, and do not be afraid. This made me think of the largest, the, mm, the loudest crowd I've ever been in. I've been in places that were louder than that uh, when I was working backstage concerts uh, back, uh, back at the Ionia Free Fair those, by speakers. I mean, you can make it louder there, but the largest, the, the loudest crowd, the loudest human voice uh, moment that I have ever been in, I know exactly when it was. Sunday, May 31st, 2009. Do you remember what that was, Nicole? All right. Nope, it wasn't the Verlander no-hitter. That was a different year. You've got the wrong date. That's an outdoor stadium. You can't get as, as loud. May 31st, 2009 was an early anniversary present from my wife. Game two of the Stanley Cup Finals in Joe Louis Arena. That tiny box of a stadium with 20,000 people in there screaming their heads off. And you'll love this moment because my beloved Red Wings beat the very much not loved in Detroit, Pittsburgh Penguins in that game. Some of you know how that series ended, so I'll leave it at that. But that game they won, and at the end of the game, the wings were firmly in control. The game was over, 19 seconds on the clock. Evgeny Malkin, boo, and that's how it was. Evgeny Malkin took a cheap shot and started a fight with Heinrich Zetterberg. And if you know hockey, you know these people. If you don't, that's okay. By the way, Mulkin lost that fight. The crowd was on its feet and the roar was deafening. I kid you not, you could feel that, uh, that noise. And I won't pretend that I wasn't on my feet yelling. Uh, I didn't notice what Nicole was doing. She was probably not yelling about the fight. Uh, if she was, then that's crowd thing, right? How you behave in a crowd, because that's not her. She doesn't care. Well, all of that to say, when God offers his people good news, it's time to say the thing that they always want to say. Stop the presses. It's time to shout it from the mountaintop as far and as wide as possible. Isaiah was telling them that rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple was news worth going up on a hill and shouting. How much more than the news of the birth of the Messiah that we proclaim at Christmas? And even more, the news we have from Easter, that Jesus not only came to save his people, but he pulled it off. He was indeed victorious over sin and death opening the way of salvation, a path now available to anyone and everyone who puts their hope and trust in him. <clears throat> Isaiah says, do not be afraid. Why would we be hesitant to shout this good news? Why would we be afraid to share it? 
Now, the answer to that is a variety of pressures and threats that may make sharing the good news difficult, even dangerous in this life. Not for us here, in this town, in this country, in this generation, but for some of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, in China, in Iran, in Pakistan, and a number of other countries where shouting the good news of Jesus Christ is a quick road to prison or death. But if this life is all there is, we would be wise to take caution about sharing our beliefs with other people if it could cost us. Yet that timid attitude falls apart when we know. Not when we think, not that when we hope, but when we know that we will all stand before our God and Maker one day and give an account for how we spent the gift of life that we've been given. Because we know that that is a reality, because we anticipate being in that spot someday. We need to climb those mountains, metaphorically speaking most of the time, but we need to climb those mountains and start shouting. Isaiah says, say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. When it comes to especially good news, sharing it with your household is not going to be sufficient. Everybody may not need to know the good news that you have, but we really feel like sharing it with them anyway. In this generation, talking about sharing news has taken on a, a different twist, right? Because people take a picture of the lunch they're about to eat and share it with everyone. And I shake my head and go, I don't know why I need to know the lunch that you were having, uh, unless it's something really spectacular. People share pictures of their pets, uh, their vacations, their children. Okay, we're, there's some of that is indeed important. It's enjoyable to share. It's enjoyable to read. Uh, if it doesn't make you sad to see that someone is in, uh, on the beach somewhere while you're shoveling snow. But good news like this is on a whole nother level. This is a much bigger scale than anything from one person's life. Even the best news, even the news of the birth of a child, even the news of a wedding, some other joyous occasion, cannot compare to news that affects vast crowds of people, indeed all nations of people. In Isaiah's case, it was news of national restoration, news for an entire nation, an entire ethnic group of people about revitalization, and that qualifies. You would want to spread that news far and wide, would you not, if your entire nation had good news? The larger fulfillment of this in Jesus Christ was indeed spread first in Jerusalem, then to Judea, like Isaiah's news, but it didn't stop there because it couldn't stop there. Isaiah had no reason to ask them to spread the news beyond Judea because this was good news for the people of, of Abraham, for his descendants, not for the whole world, but the good news in Jesus Christ, the good news, is for all peoples the world over. Jesus sent his followers to the ends of the earth, to every tribe and nation, every people in the history of the world. Is there any other news that would be not only beneficial, you know, good to know, but life and soul saving for everyone to hear? Of course not. Nothing else can compare to this. This is the top of the list. This is far more of a game changer in human history than the shot hurt round the world that started the American Revolution and the birth of modern democracy. This is more than that. This is more of a horizon lifter than one small step for a man. More singular, more song worthy than any rise of a people to overcome their tyrant. 
the news of the arrival of God in person to become Emmanuel, God with us. Not even mankind's first step off the planet Earth can compare to such news. Verse 10, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. When God is doing something, it's bound to be newsworthy for a very good reason. The power of God is unrivaled. God can do what none of us can do. And given that God is both this world's creator and judge, judge of all who live upon it, the things that God has the power to do will also include those that pertain to life and death, to salvation and damnation. These are important things that God has the power to do. When the power of God is at work, all the rules and expectations that we have based on experience, all the things that we would think are possible from life as normal, fade to the background. God does things like leading his people up out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. God collapses the walls of Jericho. God enables a teen to defeat a giant with a sling. God protects his devoted follower from hungry lions. The list goes on and on. He says, oops, sorry, see his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. The commentators struggle with this phrase, trying to figure out exactly what Isaiah had in mind. What reward was he talking about? What recompense, recompense for what? Uh, the best guess is to say he's, he's talking back about the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. Because God's blessing upon his people are many and varied. When Isaiah says his reward is with him, one of the reasons we struggle to nail that down is because there's a number of things he could be talking about. The blessings of God are so rich and varied and diverse over the years. When we fast forward and talk about Christ and that fulfillment of this prophecy, the ultimate good news, certainly Jesus is bringing that reward with him because he's coming. In flesh and blood, he's coming to live amongst us. The blessing of God isn't related to Jesus. It is Jesus. So his reward and recompense are certainly with him. Lastly, verse 11 says this, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Isaiah reminds us that while God has power and might, he chooses primarily to put them on display through tenderness and compassion. While God uses the parental analogy throughout Scripture to convey concern for and protection of his people, it will be Jesus who takes the idea of God as shepherd, one that David made famous, of course, in the 23rd Psalm. Jesus will take that and make it his own by proclaiming, I am the good shepherd, the one willing to lay down his life for his sheep. But also, at the same time, the one willing to leave the 99 behind in the safety of the pen and seek and save the one that is lost. Given that God is blessed Trinity, one God and three persons, these character qualities that we see in the Son are equally those of the Father and the Spirit. When Jesus said, let the children come unto me, it wasn't in contrast with either God's past or with the remainder of the Godhead. God, as we see here in Isaiah, was always tender-hearted and merciful, always steep, stooping excuse me, stooping to lift up the fallen. Christmas reminds us each year that we have good news to share. Here Isaiah teaches us that God's involvement in the good news business 
stretches back throughout human history. Christmas is a culmination of God's work, an exclamation point, but it is certainly not the first sentence. Let's take a look at the applications from these verses. Number one, exactly what Isaiah told us, climb the mountain and shout the good news that all might hear. It's what we're told to do. Secondly, the good news we have been given to share is built upon the combination, and this is a marvelous and wondrous combination of the power of God and the compassion of God. Good news indeed for us to share.